Hi there, I'm Mark Stutman from Folkway Music. I hope you're all doing well. Today I have a 1933 Gibson L00 on the bench, and uh, it's an early sunburst uh, L00 from 33, uh, soon after they started doing sunburst finishes on these guitars, and it has a few interesting features, um, and uh, I thought that it would make for a good show and tell here in video land. So what is it about this that I find interesting? Well, there's a lot about this particular guitar. Um, let's start with just the sunburst. It's a 1933 L00. Uh, in 1933, Gibson started uh, spraying a lacquer sunburst on these guitars. Um, you'll find 33s that are black and white, and then sometime in 33, they switch the specs to a sunburst uh, for these guitars. And the earliest sunbursts have this small center, what we call a target burst. Um, they did this in 33 and into 34. Later in 34, the sunburst would get bigger, and in 35, they got bigger still. And by 36, the sunburst was this big, and, and the looks were very different. Um, so this is a small sunburst 33. There's a few other features about 1933 guitars that are unique to 33, uh, to the very first of these um, 14 fret guitars. And, uh, and this one has a lot of those features, so I thought I'd show you a little bit about them. Um, first off, this guitar has a rosette that's black, white, black. Here, I'll show you closely. Here you, can, you can see black on the outside, white in the middle, black on the inside. It's a black, white, black rosette. This is the same kind of rosette that Gibson used on their Kelcroydons and on their blonde or the natural finish L2s. And by 33, Gibson wasn't making Kelcroydons any longer. And the L2 um, was, well, before that, the L2 was, a, uh, was the gold sparkle version. Um, 33, the L2 existed as a 14 fret guitar uh, with a natural top and a Brazilian back and side for a very short little while, and then it was gone. And um, so Gibson had a supply of this rosette stock um, and didn't have guitars to use it in, so they used it up. And so you see frequently in 33 guitars that should have a white, black, white rosette that are actually built with a black, white, black. And the, the look is totally different. Um, this black, white, black really changes the look of the rosette. Um, with white on the outside, the rosette has a, a broader, bolder look to it. Um, but with black on the outside, the black sort of mingles with the black of the sunburst, and you really only see the white line. So it has a very different look to it, very particular to that year. Uh, this also is a very early uh, guitar to have a fire stripe pickguard. It has a factory order number in the mid-700s, which is about as early as you're going to find fire stripe material. My own guitar, which is a, a 33L00, has a factory order number in the sort of upper mid 800s, and it still has a tortoise pick guard. So they use tortoise and fire stripe interchangeably uh, early on um, in the fire stripe run. Again, the black ones would have had a white pick guard, right? Uh, but they use the tortoise shell uh, pick guards on the, on the mahogany top, natural finish mahogany top LOs. Uh, and so they had that material around. Um, anyways, this is an early fire stripe, which is neat, and um, it has a really interesting bridge here. Look how thin this bridge is. I can see if I can line it up here with the camera. See how skinny that bridge is? This is an, an original bridge. It's, it, it's had some ramping done, and maybe the front is a little bit rounded, but the overall bridge height has not been adjusted. It has not been sanded. It's a factory original pancake of a bridge. It's just tiny. You can see how small that thing is. Um, this bridge at the thinnest end is just over an eighth of an inch thick, and it's just about a quarter of an inch thick at the thickest. And um, Gibson bridges from this era are all over the map as the company was trying to figure out what neck angle to set on a guitar. So they made bridges of all different thicknesses and just stuck the right bridge on to work with the neck angle that the guitar had. And so this guitar had a low neck angle from the outset, which is why it had such a small little bridge. Um, I've seen Gib Gibson bridges up to a half an, inch, half an inch thick at this time. Um, most are somewhere in between these two, um, you know, somewhere around three eighths, which is really a modern spec, normal spec bridge. Um, anyways, this is a really skinny bridge. And so I'd imagine with this really small bridge, really thin this way, it's, it's a lighter weight bridge. And it's going to be more flexible. It probably is going to help make this guitar sound extra good. The trade-off for that extra good tone is 
um, structural insecurity. I, I don't think that this bridge is going to stay put. I'm, I have to re-glue it. It's loose right now. It's never been re-glued, but it is loose. And uh, I'll re-glue it. But there's a good chance it's going to have to get re-glued again, simply because there's just not much meat back here behind the pins to keep that bridge um, where it needs to be kept. Um, but I think that's a worthwhile trade-off to have a guitar that's going to sound so good. The other difficulty with a bridge this, this thin is that the strings are, are positioned really close to the top. And so uh, when you're strumming a guitar, even with a full height saddle, um, you're going to hit the top a lot more simply because the strings are so close to the top. And so that's why this tortoiseshell is so worn out right here. The finish is worn right off this tortoiseshell, and there's actually a really deep gouge right sort of below where that E string would be um, from play wear because the strings are so close to the top. Just an interesting little thing. Um, another thing that's neat about this guitar is the dovetail. You can see this dovetail here. This is, this is the dovetail pocket. And this dovetail was made with a router and a jig. So up until this point, and after this point, into the, around 1944 or so, Gibson used a table saw to cut their dovetails. Here's a, here's a banner SJ. And you can see here how different this dovetail looks. It, it goes clean through the sides, and you can see all the um, sort of the mess left by the table saw. It's a totally different pocket to the dovetail, and um, and it was made in a different way. This is a table saw that would just change the, the blade angle, and voila, there you have your your dovetail. Whereas this guy here has a routed dovetail, which is what Gibson did in from about 44 on, and, and throughout the post-war era, here's, here's a post-war guitar, you can see this is the routed pocket, this one's from 1948. So, um, it's kind of bizarre in 1933 that you discover a guitar that has a routed pocket to a dovetail. Don't know why, um, but I find this not infrequently on guitars from 1933. Back into 34, they're, they're like the table saw jig, don't know why. But this is a 33, and, and uh, not all, but many 33s have this routed dovetail. It's kind of funny that Gibson would have this router jig and then go back to the older style table saw way of cutting their dovetails. It could just be, you know, old dog, new trick kind of thing. Um, nobody liked the, the router jig, or maybe too many fingers were getting cut off, I don't know. And, uh, and they changed it back to, to the table saw jig, at least for another 10 years. And... From around 44 on, uh, Gibson started doing this again, and, and that's how it stayed forever afterwards. Um, another thing that you find with these 1933 guitars um, is uh, what's called solid linings. And I'll pull up this LG2 again. It's handy to have a guitar with no, no top on it. Uh, so these are, these are the linings. In this guitar, they're called kerf linings. So you can see they're called kerf for a reason. They are kerfed. And, and those mahogany strips are cut that way so that they're very flexible and so they're very easy to bend and clamp uh, and, and glue to the sides of the guitar. So kerf lining is, is the norm. It was the norm before 1933 and it was the norm after 1933. Um, this kerf lining you can see is, you know, maybe three eighths of an inch wide, maybe five sixteenths. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the norm. In 1933, for a little blip of time, for no apparent reason whatsoever, Gibson started using solid linings. And so I'll try to show you this here. I gotta hold this guitar in such a certain kind of way. There you go. So you see the linings on this guitar. If I line it up, there it is. So that is solid lining. You can see it's just a solid ribbon of mahogany that's glued to the sides of the top. Um, that's, it's a classical guitar world kind of thing to do. And those linings, instead of being 5 sixteenths or 3 eighths of an inch wide, are only an eighth of an inch wide. So imagine now you take a guitar that's this size, and, and you put linings that are an eighth of an inch wide, your top is that big. If you put linings that are 3 eighths of an inch wide, your top is that big. So you can imagine the effective difference uh, is like a half an inch of, of top. This guitar top is effectively a half an inch wider than the same guitar made with kerf lining. And 
the result of that is that you have a half an inch more area of top to vibrate and move and flex and create sound. And so these solid lining guitars are often warmer, a little bassier, can be more powerful if all else is kept exactly the same. Now guitars are never all else kept the same, right? Like the thickness of the top or, or the size of the braces or the piece of wood, everything changes. But if two, if they were identical, if you could make two absolutely identical guitars and one with uh, kerf lining and one with solid lining, the one with solid linings will likely have more warmth and more bass response and more power simply because of that larger top area. And modern companies know that. Taylor's GS Mini, which is a small guitar, has a solid lining around it. Why? So that they could emulate a larger guitar in a small body. Um, classical guitar builders do that too. Um, and so it's a neat building trick. It's very labor intensive to do a solid lining guitar because you have to bend that piece of mahogany to fit and then glue it in and it just takes way longer than kerf lining. So from a factory perspective, kerf lining makes so much more sense. Anyways, in 1933, Gibson experimented with solid linings on these guitars. And in my books, the results are sonically much more interesting. And, um, and so it makes 33s a little bit extra special in my mind because of that. So that's the 1933 thing. A couple other things to know is that the tops and backs of these guitars uh, up until sometime in 33, not universally, but generally speaking, are thinner than guitars built from 34 onwards. So if you measure the top on a guitar, I met, I, when I have one of these on my bench, I measure it sort of everywhere with, um, with this, this tool here, which is called a Hacklinger gauge. It's a really pretty neat thing. So uh, it has a magnet and a spring and a piece of metal, and you pull that little metal disc inside there, and then you pull up on the spring. And the point where the spring tension betters the magnetic pull, uh, there's a disc that flips inside the gauge and it makes this noise. And so you know right there is how thick the top is and it's got this handy scale on it. Anyways, this one measures 107 thousandths right here. And if you measured it all around the top, you'll find it's not the same everywhere because these things are hand sanded and stroke sanded. Anyways, but as a general rule, these 33s and earlier guitars are, are have thinner tops and have thinner backs as well. And later, L00s are built heavier as every guitar was built heavier. And so you'll find these guitars with 115,000, 125. I've even found some with 145 thousandths of an inch top. Imagine a difference of 40 thousandths on 140 thousandths. That's, you know, it's another 35, 40% thicker. You can rest assured that that guitar is gonna sound very different than this guitar. For the better, for the worse, that's personal preference. Me, I like darkness and warmth and openness in a guitar, and you get that with a top that's on the thinner side. Um, so, solid linings, thinner top, lighter bridge. You can see where this is all going. On my own guitar, which is again a 33, has a normal thickness bridge, and uh, it measures it measures about 102 right over here, and it graduates down to about 85, um, 88 around the edges. So the whole top has this sort of pumping action, a little stiffer in the middle, lighter at the edges, but still fairly light in, in build. A lot of modern builders do the same thing where they leave it thicker here in, in the bridge area and thinner at the edges, kind of like a loudspeaker cone. I know Collins Guitars, that's a big secret to their recipe, is a pretty stiff center that, that feathers out at the edges. Um, it makes for a loud guitar. And, uh, and I don't know why, I don't know if it was intentional. I kind of don't think it was intentional that they did that at Gibson at this time. I think they just sanded the edges more because it had this binding and they had to get it flat. And so they sanded it. And as a result, the edges got thinner. It's just one of those things. Uh, finally, the neck. So here's the neck for this guitar. And um, it, when Gibson went to a 14 fret neck, they switched to a, a V carve in the neck from the round carve that they had used uh, up until that point. Now in 33, I find they tend to have a rounder profile to their V. And so this guitar has more roundness through here and through here 
uh, than, than you would expect. And, uh, and a little less depth this way and less sharpness to the V. And so they fit more like a rounded neck in your hand, although it's still a V-shaped neck, it, it's a V-shaped neck that appeals to people like myself who prefer round necks. And uh, it's, a, it's a V-neck that I have no problem playing. It's, it's really nice to wrap your thumb around. Whereas some of the later 30s guitars have a very pronounced V with sides that are much flatter and you really notice the V. So if you're a round neck person and you don't like Vs, the later 30s ones, mid, mid to late 30s are, are generally, you know, the kind of V that you, you kind of get a little bit turned off to. Whereas these ones here are nice and round. So I think that these are great necks. They're very similar if you're a Martin player. This neck feel is very similar to what Martin was doing in, in around 35. Um, it, it has a, a lot of overlap to, to what Martin was doing there. Anyway, so that is the neck on the 33. And we got the neck, we got the pickguard, we got the binding, we got the top thickness. You know, it, it basically makes for a very different guitar. And uh, I haven't heard this guitar yet. It came in with ancient strings and action that was this high. Um, so I'm excited to get this uh, all put back together so I can hear it. But I suspect, I'm an educated guess, that this is going to be a killer guitar. Um, you can't have it though, it belongs to a customer. But, um, but uh, I'll let you know when I do get it done. I don't have a ton to do to this guitar. It actually survived really well. It has, uh, it has only one little tiny crack here and, and no loose braces. I just have to reboot the bridge and fix one little tiny crack and reset the neck and we're done. Anyways, there you go, 1933 LW. I hope you found that interesting, and uh, if you have questions or comments, leave them in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer them. And thanks very much for watching. Everyone take care, have a great uh, afternoon, morning, night, whenever it is, and, uh, and all the best. Bye-bye.